Okay, so uh, yesterday I asked everybody to meet somebody, their, their buddy, their conference buddy. So uh, I'm hoping that everybody, uh, I'm not going to go through the exercise again. But uh, I do want everyone to remember who that person is, because that person is still your conference buddy. So if you see that person today, be sure to greet them. And uh, you know, I think that's an important practice. We're building our social network here. So you know, just want to make sure that we come away with you know, some friends that we can, we can speak to. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I just, before I begin, I wanted to give a few words about how to consume this talk. Because this talk is not a tips and tricks talk, right? This is going to require you to think. And I think, you know, I think everyone in this room is probably associated with or working on at least one mobile application. They may be working on two or three or five, or they may have a great idea for mobile application. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to say, hey, you need two buttons or one button, or you need to move your graphics this way or that way. Right? This talk is it's fairly abstract. It's an intellectual talk. But what I'd like you to do is think about your own application and think about these ideas. And hopefully, some of these ideas will stimulate additional thinking. So, uh, you know, it really is not a very prescriptive talk. It's not the, the five best tips type of a talk. So I'll, I'll, I'll launch into it from there. Great. So uh, just a quick little note. I, I do have a master's degree in neuroscience. This is one of my personal uh, sort of passions. I love to study and think about the brain. Uh, so you know, this is this is one of my my big uh, excitements as a as a nerd, as a kind of a geek. So I, I'm I'm very excited to talk with you. Uh, yesterday I, I mentioned that you know if either of my talks aren't really providing you with the kind of value that you want, you know I still want to be useful. And so you know if you just want to complain, you know you can email me and say, wow, that was bad. Or if you want some other additional information or anything that I can help you with, uh, you know, I, I provide my address here. So if you want, please get in touch. So you know, I'm sincere about wanting to be helpful. So I'm going to talk about the neuroscience of mobile app engagement. Now, <clears throat> I just want to say that engagement is not the only metric. Uh, I think it's important to consider that there are other metrics, but you know, how do I define engagement? Engagement is really about the user having an affinity for the application. So how is that affinity measured? So one way to measure affinity is look at how many times the app is opened. So you can look at it on a per week basis, on a per day basis. You just really want to have a running average and you want to have analytics that enable you to measure engagement on a fairly continuous basis. And from a design perspective, you're going to want to continue to drive your design towards improving mobile application engagement. You're going to want to know how long the user maintains an open session in the application. And if it's possible, you're going to want to establish benchmarks. You know, you don't really have benchmarks for your entire segment. So let's say you have some kind of a restaurant app. So you're not really going to know what other restaurant apps are doing but you can at least set a benchmark for your own application. Um, I think another thing that's interesting is how strong is the application experience? And you know, one way of measuring the strength of the application experience is looking at the virality. This is very hard to measure quantitatively. So what you can do in order to get that measurement is you can uh, do some kind of focus group type activity. So you know, sometimes it's very useful just to watch people playing with your app and trying to understand how the app goes from one phone to another phone just through the user's excitement. Uh, you know, I'm really going to focus on engagement because engagement is really where the brain gets involved, both in the behaviors as well as the emotions, as well as the intellect. So the, really taking a whole brain perspective on 
how these apps engage the user, right? And I think that, you know, what I won't talk very much about are things like the rate of user acquisition, which is, of course, a critical metric that you must continuously iterate and analyze. Uh, there are many tricks to user acquisition that go beyond, you know, uh, neuroscience. You, 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 things like, uh, you know, if the app has been opened a certain number of times, it's a perfect time you can ask the user for a five-star rating. I know that Apple doesn't like to use the word five-star in front of rating because you're asking for a five-star rating, but you can actually put a picture of five stars and then say, give us a rating, and Apple thinks that's okay. So, I mean, there are tricks. There are many tricks, but this is, again, not a tips and tricks lecture. This is really about thinking about your app. So I hope everybody is thinking about their own app. Uh, the other dimensions, I think, that are important are retention. So one of the biggest proxies for uh, retention is essentially seven-day retention. So if the user downloads the app, they have some kind of engagement between the download and the first seven days, and then they return to the app. Seven-day retention uh, is a metric that uh, Facebook uses internally for, uh, as a proxy for understanding retention and you know, whether the user is there. The other thing that's really interesting to note is that uh, the Facebook growth team doesn't consider uh, growth in terms of the absolute number of new users. They actually factor retention back in, right? So they're really thinking about the whole body and that a retained user has higher value than a new user, right? Because the retained user has actually built not only uh, investment in their social graph, but they've also put an emotional investment into the brand. So, I mean, the reason why this kind of retained user becomes extremely important is you can ask uh, Phil Libin, the CEO of Evernote. So he, he uh, basically has this wonderful graph which shows uh, essentially a one-to-one -one correlation between retention and monetization. And what it means is, is the whole concept behind monetization in Evernote is we will get you eventually. And the way it works is the longer you stay, the higher of a percentage converts to pay. And that's all. So his entire game in Evernote is just about retention. That's all he cares about. It's very interesting. And he's less focused on engagement. So I'm really kind of framing all of this and all of these analytics to talk more actually about engagement. That's the topic of today's uh, talk. But just as a closing note, uh, you know, obviously there's monetization analytics, there's utilization analytics. So when I mean utilization, I'm not talking about classical engagement analytics. I'm talking about in-app utilization. So for example, if you have an exercise app, how many pounds did they lift? How many miles did they run? If you have a storage app, how many gigabytes did they store? Those are in-app utilization metrics, also very useful. And then finally, the last little note is, you know, these three letters are really uh, kind of part of a craze in Silicon Valley, which is MVP. Doesn't stand for most valuable player, stands for minimum viable product, right? So minimum viable product is an entire methodology of application development where you try to think of what's the smallest amount of product that we can ship. And then as soon as you have that, you get it out the door, you ship, and then you iterate, right? So you constantly refine based on these types of metrics. So this is all very standard app methodology, just to get us all on the same page. But what I really wanted to talk about is I wanted to talk about the brain. So yesterday I talked about platforms. And one of the definitions that I provided for platform is that a platform is an invariant substrate atop which you launch your enterprise. Right. So the thing that I want to say is within the time frame of releasing an app, essentially the human brain is roughly generically invariant, right? I mean, obviously people change their minds and fashion and, you know, things change. But really the brain is a pretty strong invariant. And I think the reason why I'm really interested in this particular discipline is that people in the past have looked at the human as almost like a tabula rasa, as this blank entity that has no inherent properties, right? So if you look at something like a dumb terminal, like a green screen, you know, VT100, 
this kind of stuff. Like, it treats the human being as a dumb terminal, right? And in fact, the human being at its core is an evolved information processing engine, right? And that evolution came through a very distinct branch and a distinct pathway that I'll describe in my talk. And that the distinctness of the human experience through evolution should inform the way we think about the design of applications. I mean, I can put a very simple metaphor, which is, you know, if you look at a lossy compression algorithm, like let's say you look at MPEG. So MPEG video is basically just dropping information left and right. But the reason why it produces a convincing illusion of full data is because it's optimized against the human ability to perceive things like differential change, right? So one frame to the next frame, all of these kind of tricks are basically just throwing the data away in order to compress, tuned to the human. So if you took like a bird of prey, a hawk, or a raptor, and you showed them an MPEG video, it would not be convincing. It would be a very crappy experience. Right, so it's very important to understand that this is this kind of tuning is already happening. I mean, obviously, if you look at the displays that we have on our phones, it's emitting through the rare earth phosphors in the human visual spectrum. Of course it is, right? It may be emitting accidentally in other spectra. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is we're already tuning towards the brain. We just need to start thinking about it in terms of application development. So yesterday I talked about this perfect storm of mobile and cloud, but today I want to inject this third dimension, which is really to do with this amazing kind of multi-organ system that everybody you know, gets for free out of the gate. So what's the purpose of the brain? So this is, this is one of those amazing philosophical open-ended questions. So you know, I could talk the rest of the lecture on this topic, but you wouldn't get anything out of it, <laughs> so I won't. <laughs> So I'm just going to like narrow it to a sharp point, which is the sharp point I want to drive home today is that the brain is a survival engine. Right? This is the frame that I want you to use to think about why this thing exists. Right? So everyone can kind of think about the brain from the perspective of information processing. So everyone's like, yes, it's a computer. It's an information processor. Yes, that's well and good, but why was it created? Right? And in fact, the thing that's important to look at, and people don't quite get this, I'm very frustrated sometimes with uh, you know, guys like Ray Kurzweil, who talks about you know, the day that digital computers will be faster than the human brain. Like, what does that even mean? The brain is not a digital computer. The brain is analog, right? So it has no, like, you know, short of the Planck length and the Planck time <laughs> constant that's sort of the quantum base resolution of the universe, it's non-digital, like it's completely analog, right? So how exactly fast is it, right? The brain is filled with essentially ASICs, right? Application-specific circuits, integrated circuits. And they are integrated, and they are application-specific. And what are the applications? The applications for the brain are to survive, to process threat, something's moving. Is it going to kill me? Okay, I better run away. All that information processing serves a very powerful purpose in evolution. So, how was this thing made? So, I want to provide a metaphor. So, a lot of people in the room that I spoke with yesterday, like, come from, you know, IT systems, right? And they were, have worked with enterprise IT systems in various shapes. Now, I actually worked so I worked for a company, a startup company, that was acquired by a company called Web Methods that was in enterprise integration. So then Web Methods got acquired by a company called Software AG, this German company. So Software AG is a 40-year-old software company. Amazing. Right? How is that possible? So they were selling mainframe databases 40 years ago that are still running today. Right? So the thing that's awesome is, is I actually got to go to these crazy customers like Bank of Brazil and hang out with these mainframe software programmer guys you know, that have been keeping these systems alive for 40 years. Right? So, so this is 
crazy, right? Like, think about how much like COBOL code there is out in the world. All this kind of insane, dead, mainframe kind of, uh, no offense if, if there's mainframe COBOL guys here. I'm guessing most of us are mobile guys, right? But like, it's crazy, right? What is all this dead stuff doing? I'll tell you what it's doing, is it's about conservation. If you go to the CIO of Bank of Brazil and you say, I would like to do a project of modernization and I would like to replace the mainframe with these really awesome, you know, whatever, Heroku, I don't know, right? So then the guy will say, okay, how much is the budget for that? And eventually you'll come to learn that there is no budget for that. There's no budget on earth for that, right? So there's no modernization because there's no business value. Why would you replace something if it, and here's the criteria. The criteria isn't, why would you replace something if it's working just fine? It's, why would you replace something if it hasn't killed you yet? That's the criteria, right? And so IT systems are extremely conserved. So yesterday, I gave the metaphor of fractals, right? So if you look at the concept of the fractal, the fractal has an infinite surface area, but it's bound finite volume, right? So it's a very fixed amount of volume. And that fixed amount of volume is really about conservation, right? And that's the fundamental principle of the evolution of the brain. So if you actually look at the brain as an evolved IT system, the word technology is kind of stretchy, but it's an evolved information processing system, just like Bank of Brazil's mainframes, IBM mainframes running out of us database from Software AG. And think about it, that stuff is 40 years old. <laughs> this stuff is billions of years old, right? So if you want to talk about legacy databases, like this thing is crazy. This is like billions of years of evolution. So what, what I want to kind of point out is, is if you look at the conservation of these systems, like that criteria that I mentioned before is exactly the case, which is this stuff hasn't killed us yet. Right? And I say that as a species which is when you look at these brain structures, right? So if you look at the cere cerebellum, I'm not gonna like pick up the cerebellum. The cerebellum handles things like, like balance, you know? So if you're standing on one leg or this kind of stuff, right? Like that's great, right? Your cerebellum's doing a great job. If you look at a cat, a cat has a really large cerebellum because they're super well-balanced animals, right? So like the cerebellum is probably not going to kill you and it's probably going to keep you from being killed. Cerebellum, good. The guys that I'm really gonna start to pick on though are kind of more in this in the limbic system in here, like the hypothalamus, the thalamus, thalamus is actually not such a bad guy. But amygdala, there are these primitive structures that relate to things like territoriality, aggression, threat display, attack, defense, threat analysis. That kind of stuff actually has the potential to kill the whole species if we decide to start a huge war over something. So I'm not gonna get all crazy and political. I'm just saying that that part of the brain hasn't killed us yet. But I do wanna say it's in there. And this part of the brain, what I want you to observe from the perspective of application development, the part of the brain that has the most to do with behavior is actually down in this area here. Because if you look, behavior, every behavior that you see exhibited pretty much went through the spinal cord, right? And if you look at the placement of the limbic system, which is the midbrain, it's actually really driving a lot of afferent neuron connections down through the spinal column. And so if you wanna look for things like the motor cortex, motor homunculus, and these kind of driving functions, they all kind of cluster into the limbic system. And emotion is actually connected directly with systems that relate to motivation and behavior. And that's the stuff where you get engagement. So, so another software-ism is to look at everything as a stack, 
right? So everything's a stack diagram. You have, you know, in fact, I live in Silicon Valley, and you know, for those of you who've been there, uh, a friend of mine described Silicon Valley as a stack, and he said if you look, all the like chip makers like Intel are down in Santa Clara at the south end of the bay. And then you kind of come up, and then you see like operating system type guys, and then you see like Google, and you see infrastructure players like Apple with you know Mac OS, and then up, up in Redwood City you start to see like databases, right? And then in San Francisco you start to see like applications, and then you see like just web designers and stuff like that. And I guess if you cross the Golden Gate Bridge, then that's where all the humans live. <laughs> that's where the users are. I, I don't know, but but. Software guys love to think about stacks. So what I wanted to do is think about the brain evolution from the standpoint of a stack. And when I look at it historically from the standpoint of a stack, what I'm really looking at going back through time is I'm looking, as you notice, I'm going through the classic species, order, class, phylum, kingdom, right? You notice that I skipped genus. The reason why I skipped genus is, is that there's only one living like hominid genus, which is human, homo sapiens. So like, there's no need to duplicate, right? But what I'm really saying is, is human beings belong to this kind of schema. And what is interesting to note is what we have in common from a brain perspective with each of these layers as we go up the tree. Because what we're really doing is recapitulating the evolutionary history of the brain because of the principle of conservation. So let's build the brain from the, from the base. So if you look at the animal kingdom, the animal kingdom has three fairly primary threads. And some of these threads are pretty old. And in fact, you know, I didn't actually go below the concept of kingdom into the tree of life itself. Because if you look at life itself, it has non-animals have some of these capabilities. Like if you want to ask yourself about sex, for example, sex is powerful and it's old, right? If you look at how far back sex goes in evolution, you have to realize that trees are having sex, right? Like if you look at like a pear, like we have pear trees in the backyard, right? So there's a male and a female pear tree and they're cross-pollinating each other. Ha, that's crazy. Which means that the genetic precursor is, you know, the progenitor of sex is basically back when trees and humans were like all intersected, right? Which is like, definitely in the four or five billion years old range. So that's old stuff. And it's powerful, right? So when you look at, and you know, this is kind of a cliche, say like sex cells, right? Um, and as you know, like there's a lot of apps that have to do with things like meeting people or social applications, chatting, communication, flirting, whatever, all that kind of stuff relates into this kind of like substrate here. Another substrate is kind of nutrition has to do, I mean, one of the definitions of the, the concept of animal, one of the concepts of what is an animal? Well, so one of the core principles of an animal is, is it digests things inside of itself, like nutrition. Right? So it actually has a digestive system. Okay, so I guess nutrition is important, right? And when you look at apps from that perspective, there's a lot of apps that have to do with kind of seeking out food and nutrition and this kind of stuff. And then obviously the big one is threat. If you can't process threats, then you will not survive. And this is probably like the number one <coughs> processing threat. And so this is a, a big deal. Uh, so, and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these three threats. Basically, can I eat it, will it eat me, and can I mate with it, right? Those are really primary threats. If you, if you open up the task manager in the, in the brain, those threads would be high priority. Right? That was like a Windows thing, wasn't it? All right, you, you can go to the command line, type top, and then see these threads running. Okay, back to Unix. I'm happy. So, the world according to Pac-Man. So, you know, this is super proving that I'm like old. But like, for those of you who are as old as me, like there is this game way back when called Pac-Man. And you know, in Pac-Man, all these forces were at play, right? 
And here's the thing, is the inventors of Pac-Man were basically one of the core inventors of the whole video gaming genre. I mean, obviously there's precursors like Pong and whatnot. Pac-Man was huge back in the day. And it was huge because it had engagement. And why did it have engagement? Because Pac-Man was always worried about something that was going to eat it. Something that it could eat. And obviously this whole reproductive trope. When you look at game design, game design is actually right at the cutting edge of understanding engagement. Because, you know, if you look at Angry Birds, it's like the population of Angry Birds, you know, radically exceeded the population of the United States about six months ago. And it's, it's con continuing to rampage, right? So, you know, clearly engagement is, is deeply found there. The other thing that I think is interesting to note is when you see movement, this is, some, this is actually now tips and tricks land, which is when you see movement in the UI, people often experience that in their threat processing, whether you like it or not. So move, UIs that move by themselves, like watch out. There's definitely something that triggers in there. It's not always bad, by the way. So the thing that's wonderful about the human brain, and I don't want to jump the evolutionary stack, but one of the wonderful things is that human beings are the masters of abstraction, right? So the thing that's wonderful is, is a human being can actually construct, they have this loop that I'll talk about later, which is this loop that constructs a, per, a perception of self, right? And it's amazing how the human invests themselves into like their environment, right? So they have, they have this whole concept, and one of these concepts that's sort of mediated by cortical neurons is this concept of how things should be. Right? So in some sense, they invest their own identity in how certain things should be. Right? And if things are disrupted from how they should be, then they feel like they're being attacked. Right? It's amazing. Right? So if, if, you're, if you're sitting in the hotel and you're having breakfast and then the, like, the waiter bumps the table and everything shakes, you know, people are like, ah, I'm being attacked. You know, and it's crazy, right? I mean, it's, it's totally crazy. But the thing I wanted to bring home is, is that people process things like threats. So for example, if you look at news and weather apps, people are actually looking at the news and they're actually trying to process the news as environmental threat, right? And if you look at news applications, they're very engaging. People want to know. They're, they want to know like what's going to happen, you know, who's going to be elected as president, you know, that's a US thing. But like, you know, everybody's processing these things that they perceive as threats, right? And when you look at politics, sometimes it turns into sports. And obviously sports is in there too, right? Where you start to look at the good guys and the bad guys, and you start to hate someone who you don't know for no reason. So that's in there. So you look at these kind of apps. And obviously gaming is in there too, within the threat processing thing. Right? I mean, one of the things that's amazing about threat processing is that if you create a simulated or artificial threat, it can actually cause that part of your brain to engage and thus create relaxation. This is a phenomenon that's called eustress. So there's really two kinds of stress. There's distress, which is negative stress, and there's positive stress called eustress. So when you have a game that's kind of activating your stress circuits, it actually helps you relax. And the more stressed out you are, the more scary you want the threat stimulus to be. You know. So zombies attacking and this kind of stuff can be very relaxing if you're pretty high strung, like myself. Um, so obviously nutrition relates to things like transportation, navigation, and just generally moving in your environment. And you know, the thing that's interesting is, is when I talk about abstraction, you know, this sexual impulse actually extends beyond just dating apps to things like fashion, and diet, and you know these things start to crisscross. I mean, even fitness can relate to whether you're having a good mate selection process for yourself. So, so these these are very big threads, and they relate to engagement. Um, so, kind of moving up the stack, the next thing that's interesting is is that you know if you look at the chordates, right, which are the vertebrate species, you know the, the thing that's interesting about the organization of these species is, is that, you know, most of these species parks some kind of processing unit 
on here. So if you look at the dinosaurs, right, the dinosaurs were so large as chordates that they actually had a peripheral processing unit on the tail end to handle activity on that end, you know, because the brain side was like, you know, too far away from the tail to work the organism, right? And, and you know, the other thing that's interesting to note is if you look at the vertebrate nervous system, in humans, one thing that's kind of interesting is, is that the majority of neurotransmitters are actually in the enteric system, in your gut, rather than kind of floating around in your brain, which is kind of an amazing, weird statistic. But the gut nervous system actually is a, a whole different topic of, of great interest. But I think, to me, the thing that's kind of most interesting is what's this big blob of neurons doing on the end of the spine? So let's dig in deeper. So this is one of the big culprits in kind of core engagement, right? Which is the amygdala is responsible for uh, emotional memory. It actually is inside of the face recognition loop. This is a very interesting evolutionary history, which is, you know, human beings as social primates are really awesome at face recognition. And if you actually look at what the amygdala is doing in the facial recognition loop, is it is doing facial threat processing. So if someone is like freaking out, look out for the bus, right? You can read the expression really quickly because the amygdala is right in the loop. And uh, there's this amazing syndrome if you actually kind of get brain damage across this region. You know, if it's sufficiently large of a region, you can actually get this experience where the person doesn't see faces at all which is just this amazing syndrome. They just see this blur right where the face should be. It's quite amazing. Um, and sex and aggression both kind of reside in the amygdala. Another kind of limbic system component is the striatum. And this is another one that really kind of connects back to mobile application engagement. And the reason why is because this is part of a dopaminergic system that relates to reward behavior. One thing that I want you to note is, is that if you actually look at this substructure underneath that we'll talk about in a moment, the hippocampus, the hippocampus actually is responsible for storing associative memory, right? And so if you look at reward and memory, reward and memory are interconnected. And this is really related to the concept of addiction, right? Which is for gamers, the concept of an addictive game is really important. But what I don't want to do is let you off the hook if you're not making a game because it's possible to use gamification techniques and technologies to create a level of addiction to a non-game as you have to a game. Because one of the things that you really ought to think about is you really ought to think about what are the endorphin releasing moments in your app, right? So very simple, like if you look at Facebook, for example, an endorphin releasing moment is, oh, somebody liked my post. And it's like, what is that about? Somebody liked my posts. I mean, I got to tell you, like, uh, I, I started doing a meditation practice. And one of the things I noticed is, is like the stupidest things come into my mind while I'm meditating. And sometimes the stupid thing, one of the stupid things that came into my mind once was, I posted something really smart on Facebook. I wonder if anybody's liked it yet. It's just horrible. Like, it's like, what a stupid thing to be in my mind, right? And, and yet, so why is that there? It's there because of vanity. And what is vanity? Vanity is really about kind of like this, I don't know. To me, I think it may be connected with like some kind of primitive reproductive success loop, which is, you know, hey, if people like me and they like my posts, then I'll be more popular. If I'm more popular, I'll have better mate selection. <laughs> It's pretty awful, but it's in there. Uh, so, so the thing to look at from your app perspective is how can you create these addictive loops and what is the dopamine and endorphin releasing moment in your app? What is the kind of thing and can you accentuate that? Can you accentuate that through different kinds of game mechanics? So for example, one game mechanic that's really interesting is collection and completion. Right. So one way to increase the propensity of people to engage in a behavior is to show them a progress bar. Right. So you can say, oh, well, you have, 
you have four of these and you, not, you need five. And it can be totally arbitrary. It's like, why do I need five? It doesn't matter. Right? If users have four and you tell them they need five, they're going to get five. Right? You're going to get them back in the app, right? The other thing to look at is kind of how you use in-app notification. So you can pull them back into the app and say, hey, hey, you only have four, but you need five. Come back. It's, it's very weird, but people are a little obsessive compulsive about collection and completion. I think these other kind of rubrics that release dopamine are things like social reward. Right? So liking is, a, is a big, obviously a big thing. Uh, and uh, you know this this kind of reward behavior, I think, is really important. And it kind of pull, pulls all the way back into gamification. So I I'm, I don't have the kind of focus in this talk to talk fully about gamification, but this is kind of a big raging topic in Silicon Valley. And you know if you're interested, uh, you know the the person responsible for this research is. Uh, um, Basically, uh, the woman who runs Zio Design, X E O, and um, you know, you, you can just look through Zio Designs online. She basically has deconstructed gamification into four primary components, which she calls uh, hard, fun, which is sort of challenge. So this is about frustration and focused attention and mastery, right? So you kind of get better and better and better at it, and you get frustrated, right? So you know, Angry Birds, it's like, hey, I, I can't destroy this pig for it, like, you know, I'm just frustrated, right? And that the more frustration you have, the more endorphin release you have when you succeed, right? So that's a really tricky engagement, because what you're really trying to do is you're trying to tune your environment so that the challenge level is not frustrating to the point of quit, but it's not easy to the point of non-engagement. So that's about tuning your gamification. Um, you know, the other one is kind of, uh, surprise and curiosity. So this is kind of a discovery exploration type of a trope in gamification. And then obviously there's this uh, kind of relaxation, excitement kind of stuff. And then over here there's more of what's called people fun, which is kind of the social engagement aspect of fun. Um, I won't go too deep here, but I just want to kind of share that gamification is a whole separate topic that deserves attention. So. This is where life becomes really interesting to me. Because, you know, I, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm a, I'm a dad. And so I notice weird things about, like, human behavior from being a dad. For example, like, one day my kid came up to me with a stick. And he started poking me with a stick. So I'm just sitting here, I'm like, what is this? Like, you're poking me with a stick. Like, this is just crazy, right? And the kid actually had two sticks, and he handed this other stick to me. So I was like, okay, now I'm holding a stick, and now he's poking me with the stick. So I start poking him with the stick. <laughs> and then he starts running away, right? And then he kind of comes back, and then I'm kind of just sitting here again with the stick, and then he starts poking me again. I'm like, what, what is this, right? And so the thing that's really interesting is, is that what he seems to be doing is he seems to be doing predator threat simulation, right? Like he's basically taunting the big animal and the big animal is going to be attacking and then he's going to run away and then he's going to come back and then he's going to taunt the big animal, you know? And he's kind of practicing escape behavior, you know? And so, so the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this way is, is Mammal, this is pretty unique to mammals. And I'll tell you why it's unique to mammals. is because mammals have parts of their body, at least the female side, has parts of their body that provide nutrition to the offspring. And that there's this relationship to the offspring. And there's this connection that creates this kind of family unit kind of thing. And mammals kind of have that, where the, you know, lizards and fish don't. So for example, if, if you watch fish, there's no statistical reason for a fish to differentiate between its young and food. Because it's a wash, statistically. It's like, did I just eat my kids? Like, don't care. You know, I mean, that's, that's what they're like. I mean, you know, mammals care a more if they like accidentally eat their kids. So, and this is starting to get 
into humanity, right? Which is not all mammals, like, suck quite as bad as human beings when they're born, right? Like, if you watch deer being born, like, watch a deer being born it's on YouTube. It's just crazy. Like, the thing, like, falls out of its mouth. And then it, like, gets up and starts running around. It's like, dang, you know? And it's almost as good as an adult deer at that point. Like, that's just crazy, right? Look at human babies. Unbelievable. Like, human babies aren't decent enough to kind of run around on their own until they're, like, 26. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I apologize to anyone under the age of 26. That was, that was crappy. I'm only applying it based on my own personal experience of myself, which is, prior to that age, I didn't know anything. So, all right, sorry. Bad, bad thoughts. Um, but babies have a threat processing problem. They can't even see very far. It's ridiculous. And even if they could see far, what would it be like to be a human baby that could see really far? What would it be like to be a human baby that could see really far and process threats? Oh, here comes the tiger. Oh, yes, okay, that tiger's going to eat me. Okay, I'm dead. I mean, that's what it would be like, right? So the point is, is that the baby actually has a threat coprocessor, and that the interface that it's using is the mom's face. And as I told you, it goes through the amygdala face recognition circuit to process the threat information from the mother's face. So the mom is worried. The baby's like, okay. Because you know, when you watch babies, they're walking around, and then they like run into a table. It's the first thing they do is they look at their mom. Like, Did I just die? <laughs> like, they don't know. All right, and the mom smiles, and the baby's like, hey, that's cool. Right? In fact, there's research that was done where you put a closed circuit camera and the baby gets upset and then the mom makes a oh no face and then the baby relaxes. Because right? the mom knows that the baby's unhappy, right? And if the mom knows the baby's unhappy, then the baby feels happy because they're like, okay. And what, the, what is that? That's essentially offloading emotional limbic co-regulation into the parent, right? So it's basically like, uh, I encounter data that I don't know how to process. So I'm going to transmit to you my worry face. Worry face. And then the mom looks at the worry face, and she also makes a worry face, but it is a transitory worry face. What is transitory worry face? It means that the mom goes, oh no, and then she smiles. Right? So the transitory worry face is basically this handshaking mechanism for threat co-processing. How does this relate to mobile apps? I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a good one is this behavior is so deep in humans that the transitory worry face is actually equivalent to your system for supporting your app users. So for example, if a user encounters a bug in your app, they start having that same baby reaction. They're like, oh, I don't know how to solve this. I'm really worried. Right? And then they do the facial interaction with the mom where they're like, this app did a forced close. And then they send it to you. And then you send a reply being like, oh, yes, we know about this bug. We're fixing it in the next release. Don't worry. And then the app user goes, oh, I can relax. <laughs> Everything's cool again, right? But that's important, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. This is something that you'll notice. So this slide appeals to different age groups. So I don't know if you, you watch Pixar movies. But this movie is The Incredibles. And in The Incredibles, there's this superhero, Violet, who can create a bubble. It's like an immunity bubble, right? So anyone attacking is like deflected from this bubble, right? So that's if you're like, you know, in a family or whatever, you're watching this kind of movie, right? So if you're a dad and you have a kid, you're probably playing Super Mario. So, you know, in, in Super Mario Brothers, they have this also this concept of the bubble where Mario can kind of pop himself into a bubble and can't be harmed, right? So if you look at, like, so for the rest of you, there's World of Warcraft. So in World of Warcraft, there's a character, a paladin character, that can basically create an immunity bubble. And they're inside of this bubble and they can't be harmed, right? So what is up with this? 
Like I say, wow, what's this concept? Why is this concept of a bubble such a ubiquitous concept in all these different media and games and things like that, right? So to put it kind of finally, right, human beings actually do have a user experience of perfect protection, perfect nutrition, perfect tranquility in the womb. Right? So there's a certain point in time where they're in a place, and it's, and I gotta tell you, this is a user experience, right? Is it really perfect protection? No, I mean, if your mom like, is, is smoking crack or something, it's, it's bad, right? So you're not perfectly protected, but it doesn't matter, because the user experience is perfect protection. Right? You're like, hey, this is cool in here. Right? So what does this have to do with the app thing? This is a critical concept because what I want to project to you all is that we've created with the mobile application, we've created a new environmental space that I call the bubble. And the bubble is so important because when we created the World Wide Web, there was this concept that emerged that was called cyberspace. So what is cyberspace? Cyberspace is non-location. It's a location that has no location. Right? So it's like, I'm going to go surf the web. Where are you? I'm in cyberspace. Where is cyberspace? Doesn't matter. Cyberspace has no location. Right? But the mobile application is not in cyberspace, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you where you are. When you're playing Angry Birds, you're standing in line at the bank. This is not no location. This is a specific location. Right? You're in line at the bank. What is the quality of that location? The quality of that location is, is it kind of sucks, right? Because you're like, I don't want to be standing in line at a bank. This is a bad place. So what does the user do? The user wants to go not to cyberspace. They want to go to the bubble. They want to be reconnected with this universal tranquility and sometimes the tranquility has a little bit of play threat in it so that that can engage and cause the threat processing to relax a little bit. But at the end of the day, the thing that's important to understand is, and from, from a mobile application perspective, the bubble is something you should not disrupt. It, it, it's why things like Crashlytics and Criticism are such important SDKs because you want to track every single crash because what is a crash? A crash is the bubble pops. That's the worst thing you can do, right? So the user's like, I'm in line at the bank. This is a bad place. I don't want to be here. I want to be in Angry Bird Land. And then the thing crashes. What are you doing? You're ejecting your user back out into this noxious place from which they sought to escape. This is a bad event. So you need to preserve the bubble. What about things like mobile advertisement? Mobile advertisement, the worst offender is the banner ad. If you're inside an application and you click on a banner ad, 40% of clicks are either fraudulent or accidental, right? On banner ads, in app. And what happens to that click? You're kicked out of the app, right? And a lot of times it's a mistake, and, not, and a lot of users are not super sophisticated, and they're not like, oh, I'm multitasking, go back. They're like, what happened? I'm out of the bubble, right? That's, that's a bad event. It's like being born. Uh, so, I don't want to go too deep on this. This is on my blog at nico.com, M-I-K-O.com. I wrote about mom as kind of a user experience. And the thing that being high investment mammals gives you is additional layers. So if you look at, for example, will it eat me? This is threat processing. There's this concept of will it protect me, right? Which is an additional layer. Can I eat it? Will it nourish me? That's another layer, right? Can I mate with it? Will it groom? me. That's another layer. So these are different layers. And if you look at the evolution of additional layers, you know, social primates actually start to engage in facial limbic co-regulation even with people who aren't parents or parental figures. And this kind of social facial interaction is a very important part of being human. And obviously this is an emergent Condition. So people are like, well, so this is all very interesting, but what about social behavior? So social behavior to me is extremely emergent as a function of being social primates because the village will protect me. 
The village will bring me things to eat. The village will bring me potential mating partners, this kind of thing, right? The family, the tribe, the village. So all of those layers are built on top of the core infrastructure. I wanted to quickly note that this is my pin Pinterest. And if you look at the thing that happened to my Pinterest is, is that so my, my Pinterest used to be almost entirely about food. Can I eat this stuff, right? Uh, and just some stuff ended up kind of coming in. So this, this guy, you notice this rabbit's name is Broccoli. Right? So I was searching for a broccoli recipe, and this guy showed up. So I was like, oh, God, that guy's so cute. So I, like, I said, OK, so I pinned him on my board. And now all of a sudden, different cute animals are showing up on my board. And I was like, what is this? It's like, you know, I even made a joke underneath here. I said, you know, this is non-vegan broccoli, right? Like, if you eat this, you're not a vegan, right? even though it's broccoli, right? So I looked at that, and I was like, what is he doing here? It's like, this is ruining my theory. I'm all angry. It's like, you know, I can't eat this rabbit. I, I, I certainly don't want to mate with this rabbit. It's not attacking me. I was like, what is this doing on my board? And it's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm a mammal, right? This thing is cute, right? So I, what it's actually doing is it's actually preying on the weakness of my brain, which is basically assuming that cute, defenseless things require protection and nourishment. And you know, maybe, maybe it contains my DNA. I should protect it. Right? So these are the things that kind of pop up in terms of engagement. I won't go, go too far into this, but Robin Dunbar is a social psychologist who invented this social grouping number. 100, 150 is how many people we can maintain social relationships with, thanks to things like language, which is great. Uh, it turns out if you're a grooming animal, like a orangutan, your number is only about 76. And I already talked about this one. So, Let's get to the chase, which is the thinking brain. So everyone's all like, yeah, neocortex, this is where the action is, right? So let me give you a tip here. So the word cortex means bark. And we're not even talking about a thick bark like a redwood. We're talking about birch bark here, right? If you take six business cards and stack them up, that's how thick the neocortex is. That's the part of your brain that's responsible for thinking, cognition, intellectual activity. It's pretty crappy, right? It's two millimeters. That ain't much. And it's segmented into six layers. So this is pretty much what the deal is with the neocortex. And you know, the thing is, is what does the brain do when it's idle? So if you look at a car when it's idle, it just kind of runs the motor, right? So what, what is the motor that runs? So here's the thing that the motor runs. It, it runs, so this structure is the hippocampus, which is memory, associative past memory. So this stuff actually interacts with the medial prefrontal cortex here, which is imagination about the future. So it actually starts, so the brain naturally goes into the past and the future, right? And what happens is the medial prefrontal cortex starts adding evaluation. It starts adding this kind of like critical analysis. And the way it sounds, it sounds kind of like, gee, I wonder if I need new shoes. Hey, does that, that guy, I'm going to make up fake stories about that guy over there. That guy has a mustache. He looks like my uncle. Michael's a jerk, you know, like that's the kind of stuff that your brain does. And it creates stories, right? So this, this is a really amazing thing. But the problem with it is, is that when you get into this loop, it actually kind of puts you into a really weird world. Because the world that you create inside of your brain, inside of these loops, is essentially completely fictitious and constructed. Right? So I, what I really wanted to touch on in closing is this concept of this transcendental thing. So like, you know, I cited a quote from this guy yesterday, big fan. This guy says, you know, I, I won't let anyone walk through my mind with their dirty feet. Right? It's great. He's not sitting in meditation having, thinking about like, whether fucking his Facebook. <laughs> I mean, you know, I just need more practice. But, uh, you know, I think this is like a great rewiring that's possible, right? So this is where this co-evolution of human and machine starts to get into the ability to rewire. So, you know, this research, so I just want to cite uh, Kelly McGonigal, who is a research professor at Stanford. And she's done a lot of thinking and writing about this old meditation technology. 
And this research isn't done by her, but it's basically talking about the insular cortex and the role of the insular cortex in mediating pain. And it turns out, this is a really interesting fact, I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to be very brief, but really what it says is it says that meditators actually experience more of the sensation of pain, but that they disengage the narrative associated with it, the suffering narrative, the chatter, the talk, right? which is very fascinating. Because one of the things that novice meditators do is that they actually block the sensation of pain which is mediated by the insular cortex. So the thing that's cool about this research is, is that meditators are doing this when they're not meditating. So it's pretty cool. So what it means is that if you're a practice meditator, it means that you're actually rewiring your brain to process things like pain differently by attending to the sensations in the body, which is pretty cool. So what is this default thinking behavior? What does it do? it actually constructs and it defends a concept of self. So for example, my table, nobody should bump into my table. That's a concept of self. And when that concept is disrupted by someone bumping the table, you have a posture. But they also did this breathing research and they discovered this phenomenon called email apnea, which is people stop breathing while they're doing their email, which is kind of amazing. And so I just want to kind of cite some of these technologies that are emerging. This is the work of Nancy Doherty that I saw at the Quantified Self Conference. She actually created these ingestible sensors. It's an amazing thing. And so what happens is, is that on her iPhone, the iPhone actually records the time that she took any of these pills because these are ingestible sensors. And when you take this pill, it actually goes into your digestive system. As soon as it starts digesting, it starts signaling through Bluetooth, and it says, I've been ingested, right? And so what she thought she would do is she thought she would create placebos. So every time she felt like she needed to be calm or needed to have more willpower, she would pop this pill. And it would be a calm pill or a willpower pill just to see what would happen. And then all of this is being recorded on her mobile device. Fascinating research. And then, you know, another one, this is HeartMath Institute which is these guys invented a device that measures heart rate variability. So I'm not going to get deep into HRV, but this is a technology that actually tracks the intervals between your heartbeats. There's folks doing this in the smartphone space too, by the way, HRV on the iOS and the Android device. So what I'm really kind of alluding to here is just a whole set of smartphone applications that are going to expand the range of sensors and that are going to expand the range of applications, and that are going to more deeply integrate with the human and the human consciousness in order to create a much more kind of, a, I would call it, prosthetically enhanced consciousness. So this is the whole field that I'm kind of getting really excited about. So uh, I, I have basically no time to conclude. But what I do want to say is, uh, this URL is something that we launched uh, last night. Very excited about it. I talked about it yesterday, which is the key cloud. This is very unrelated to my talk. This is just a like, hey, check it out. Uh, so you can go to developer.key.com and you can get yourself a free like API key and you can wire. This is my mobile cloud right, that we launched. Uh, it's free during the public beta, so I, I encourage you guys to all go. If you go to key.com, you can find your way here too as well. But this is our developer portal. And, uh, you know, we launched it last night. So, you know, unfortunately, I'm kind of constrained on time. But I just wanted to say it's been a great pleasure here. And, uh, you know, thank you so much. And, and thank you for, to Salt March Media for the invitation. So thanks, everyone.